How is it going to all my little Christmas turkeys out there in the world? Welcome to another episode. I wanted to make a upload today to show you all of the stuff I've been working on. I've been stuck at home and I've kept myself quite busy with upgrades to some of my enclosures and they are for the most part looking awesome. So I want to show off a little bit. And also we're going to do some feeding because it is feeding day for my snakes. So get excited. This is going to be a good one. All right, let's get right into it. I'm going to use this snake hook as a pointer because I have no real use for it. None of my snakes require hooking currently. First thing we're going to check out that's brand new in my apartment is this front opening bioactive exoterra enclosure for my green tree python toothpaste. He is absolutely loving it. I'm really proud of this thing. This uh, enclosure itself retails for, I don't know, almost $200. I got it for, actually more than $200. I got it for $100 Canadian, secondhand, but it's in like new condition. Uh, we have a drainage layer of pea gravel and hydro balls. Uh, then we have organic potting soil, and then we have cocoa car, cocoa core, sorry, cocoa blocks and some treated leaf litter. Treated as in I boiled it and uh, baked it to make sure it didn't have anything foreign on it. We got live plants, namely pothos, uh, this thing, some uh, ferns in the back. And what I'm really proud of is the background here. This is all spray foam that I covered in silicone and then in cocoa core. So it looks very naturalistic. It's one of a kind, as opposed to those cookie cutter styrofoam ones that they come with. I actually have a little bit of a two-dimensional aquarium background in the back, which is usually a no-no, but I think it actually works here. And it kind of creates a three-dimensional depth. Uh, the snake himself has been loving it. Uh, however, when I first started out, I couldn't get the humidity up to where it needs to be. It was hovering at about 30, even with heavy misting. So what I did is I covered the screen top, if you look up here, uh, partly with a piece of acrylic and then partly with and then partly with tin foil right here uh, I also obscured the light a little bit to the right because it was too hot But by kind of partitioning it like that I've been able to create the exact temperature he needs for a hot spot right here and We've also been able to get if you look here The humidity is up to 70% both here and in my other meter up here and humidity is really important for these guys So I'm very proud to have been able to make it work uh, I think it looks great. I've got live springtails and isopods crawling around down here, eating uh, not only the snake's waste, but any mold or funguses that might form, which is cool. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I was stressed out when I couldn't get the humidity right, but now that it's going, I am ecstatic. I think this looks great. I know the snake is happy. And it's just a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to do. The next thing to check out is the 100% from scratch DIY $0 enclosure I made for Carpacina, my carpet python right here. This is an Ikea bookshelf made of melamine that I found on somebody's front lawn. And I knocked on their door and asked them if they had bed bugs because that's always a concern when you're taking things off the side of the road. They said no. Uh, I found that this exact size coincided with this uh, panel of glass from a display cabinet that I also found on the side of the road. Uh, and because it's Ikea, it had this little uh, liner or like backing that slid in place. And I was able to DIY just by kind of drilling this all together, uh, putting this panel, which luckily enough was the exact right size to go in here like this. And you can see there's a little old lady etching Kind of thing on here but uh, no complaints because it was free it's also a single panel when you more commonly see two panes that can slide back and forth kind of a pain but again zero dollar enclosure which is on par with a lot of the pvc or vision cages out there i'm really happy with this i put a little wooden bar uh in place here to keep the substrate in and then within that i have actually a bit of a vinyl shower liner that i've made as kind of like a a diaper for uh, so that we don't get too much actual humidity on the on the wood itself or any real wetness and it can handle quite a bit because not only is it melamine uh, which is particle board with essentially a plastic coating over it I also sprayed it with uh, some some lacquer sealant and also silicone it as if it were an aquarium all around the baseboard area we've got a piece of naturalistic driftwood that I found underwater in the Great Lakes 
We've got a bioactive substrate with cocoa blocks, isopods, springtails. We have a medical model of a child's foot, which I just think is weird and fun. And the python has a heat pad, which is actually under the substrate, under a ceramic floor tile. So the heat rises up into that floor tile, emanates through the floor tile, and I've got it right where I want it. So this snake is happy as a clam. Carpet pythons are semi-arboreal, so they, while they can thrive in a tub setup, it's not very naturalistic for them, and I think that Carpuccina here really appreciates the upgrade. So that's cool. Moving right along, we go down here on the same thermostat. We have, we have the Call Albino Bow Constrictor, who was sold as a female, turned out to be a male, also turned out to have mites. Uh, he spent the last several weeks, or even a month, in quarantine in a very minimalistic setup with, with no real substrate, just paper towel. While I was treating him for mites, that's all sorted out now, and he's been moved into this much bigger, much taller, much more elaborate enclosure, and he's absolutely loving it. He's looking great. I also put some of my sterilized leaf litter in here, and he just loves it so much. He hides amongst it. He uh, shoots out when you offer prey. He shoots out from under it, and it's, it's really cool. I think it's something I'm going to do for more of my snakes in the future. The mites are 100% taken care of, but unfortunately he does have a bit of nose rub, which was already an issue when I got the snake, uh, but it got a little bit worse while I was keeping him in that quarantine tub, and I don't blame him for rubbing on the top trying to get out, because it was a very boring, minimalistic setup. And I think that we are going to see the issue resolved now that he's in here, and he's much happier, and he has room to roam. I know some of you guys watch for the reptiles and you don't care too much about this kind of stuff, but I did cut my aquarium foliage way, way down. I took all the pieces that I cut that were tall and I planted them down low, so I have a much more serious, uh, almost kind of like a shrubbery, like a, a carpeting of vegetation. It gives more swimming room up top for the fish, which they really enjoy. Uh, this is also a new fish. This is called a, a powder blue gourami, and he's kind of the star of the tank since I put him in. He's my favorite gulliver. He's very active and friendly. Mr. McFeely. The other hot gossip in the fish world is I had this 20 gallon tank that I found on the side of the road with this filter that I found on the side of the road cycling for a long time with nothing in it and I said what do I want to put in here and I finally came to the decision that I wanted puffer fish. So I have four pea puffers. They're the smallest species of puffer fish. They're absolutely a freshwater puffer which is cool because I don't really mess with salt water. But these guys are absolutely awesome little fish with a great personality. Uh, they're carnivores, so I feed them bloodworms and I feed them snails that I grow myself. So very soon I'm gonna have enough of these red ram's horn snails to have an entirely self-sustained circle of life with the pea puffers and the snails, which is cool. They're a lot of fun to observe, they're a lot of fun to feed, and I really highly recommend them because they're actually super easy. Uh, they're also dirt cheap, which was something I didn't expect. They're also very hard to focus on. <laughs> anyway, we've been having a lot of fun with these guys. I got one more thing to show in the underwater world. Okay, this tank isn't too much to look at, but here are the ram's horn snails that I was just talking about. These are a favorite food of any puffer fish uh, and, you know, pure protein. Beyond that, this is a shrimp tank. So it's my snail farm and my shrimp farm. Hopefully you can see him. There's one there, there's one there. These are blue really shrimp. They retail for about $8 each. Being the genius that I am, I pointed out the two shrimp that I wanted to the pet store guy and he got them for me. Those two shrimp were heavily pregnant. So I beat the system and I got about $58 shrimp for $16. I consider myself a mental giant and that is one of my best trade secrets for you to take home. Look for pregnant shrimp, buried shrimp, they're easy to recognize. And get those thick mamas in your tank as soon as you can. Because it's absolutely the best way to jumpstart a shrimp colony. So headed over to the arachnid zone. I'm very excited to announce that... Well, this front opening Exoterra retails for 130 Canadian. I got it used for 30, and it's hard to believe, but just two days later, I found an identical matching one 
on the side of the road here in downtown Toronto. So I guess somebody's pet died and actually I remember it was hermit crabs. It was set up for hermit crabs, a totally stupid enclosure to have hermit crabs in because there's no reason for them to have all this vertical space. They'd be better off with a wider enclosure with more of a footprint. So somebody had hermit crabs probably with their young children. It didn't work out. They just threw this whole thing out by the, their garbage area and I saw it as I was walking past. A pretty crazy stroke of luck if you ask me. I think a lot of people walked past this and didn't see it as anything valuable, but for me that's $130 and something that I really wanted and needed. So I now have two matching identically sized front opening exoterras for my bugs. I initially only needed the one. I got it for a very good reason and that is for this new tarantula that I got. This is a very young sling, which is what you call a baby tarantula, of a kind of rare species of tarantula called Carabina versicolor. They come from the Caribbean and they are arboreal. They live in the trees and what's cool about them is they are bright blue. Looks like it's kind of hard to see right now because it's behind some webbing and there's some glare from the enclosure. But one day this guy or girl is going to be big enough to go in here and climb all around and it's going to look phenomenal. As it stands right now, I've got my Asian forest scorpion in here. You can't really see him, but he's hiding back there. Again, this isn't his dream enclosure because it's taller than it is wide and he's not much of a climber, but no reason to not have him in this beautiful display tank while I have it uh, lying empty. I'm also proud of the custom background I did on this one. Again, with spray foam that I carved up with a steak knife, layered with silicone and then blasted with coconut dust. Uh, didn't really work out over here. I'm gonna fix that by maybe hot gluing a little bit of sphagnum moss up there. There's a place where plants can grow here. Like there's a half a flower pot behind this mound. Uh, I've got a little, what do you call it? I've got a little pothos in there, but it's not looking too impressive yet. Eventually I hope to have all these fake plants replaced with real ones. Going over to the second enclosure. Again, a custom background, very simple, uh, blasted with cocoa fiber. There's a couple spots that didn't adhere and I'm gonna fix them. In here we have my Ofono Pelma Simani adult tarantula. There she is there. Sorry to disturb you, girl, but we got to show you off because you're so dang pretty. Um, again, not a huge climber. They don't, they're not really going to utilize this back wall in the same way that my arboreal carabina versicolor is going to. But also plenty of space. No reason not to keep them in here since I have it. Both these animals would be just as happy in a plastic Tupperware whatever. But it brings me joy to be able to see them a little bit more and show off my enclosures that I put together. All right, headed over to the snake rack. I wanna let you guys know that almost all of the ball pythons that I produced this year, of which there were 11, are sold off to new good homes. I have one, two, three babies left, and two of them are most likely gonna stay as holdbacks, and I have the other one leaving tomorrow. So in addition to being a whole lot of fun and a really exciting year-long project, this has been a big success and I did make a chunk of change. I don't mind telling you. I made a little bit of money, which is great in a year where I was severely underemployed and unemployed for much of it thanks to COVID. Uh, it's been a godsend and it's been a really fun project. So, everybody's looking good, everybody's healthy, but there are a couple things I want to show you. One of which is Mr. Friendship, remember him? He had mouth rot and by medicating him twice daily on his first shed, it's almost completely gone. This, that was all a, oh, sorry, buddy. This was all a brown scab under his chin. Now it is gone skis and he just has a little bit there. So in one more shed, we're gonna have this totally under wraps. He's gonna be looking good and ready to go to a new home. And a quick update on my LP, my Lassiodora parabiana, bird eating spider, bird eating tarantula. She had another molt and she's looking huge. Remember when I first showed you guys this thing? It was about that big. Look at her now. And again, I've put her on heat in a snake rack. You don't have to put tarantulas on heat. The rule is if you're comfortable, they're comfortable. They're happy with room temperature, but just putting them in this controlled, you know, more humid and slightly warmer environment, I've seen quicker growth as well. So that's cool. So as you can see, I've been busy, lots of new things happening around here, uh, but that is it for now in terms of updates. What I'd like to do now is take you along to do a quick rapid fire feeding compilation. I know you guys like those. Let's get into it. 
All right, to start off, we have Mighty Max, which is what we're calling him, because he came in with mites. And yeah, he's just dealing with that little bit of nose rub that we're gonna get taken care of shortly. Come on, buddy. Ooh, that was quite a strike. Okay, we'll leave him to it. Now we're doing Harry Belafonte, the Enchi Banana. Come on, buddy. And he, everybody thinks he has nose rub too, but ooh, it's just a weird freckle. You can see there. Here we have Mr. Friendship, who we were just checking in on a few seconds ago. You hungry, buddy? Yes, you are. Okay. All right, next up we have Stunner, the Sherbert Fly, which is a super pastel fire pinstripe, mother of many of the snakes I produced this year. Well, half of them. Oh, it's a good eater. Uh, you might notice that my prey items are a little bit smaller than they should be, and that is because I bought the wrong size. So a lot of these guys will be getting two, uh, except for the ones that are on a diet. They're, they're just going to get the one. Excellent. Good stuff. Here we have Big Mama, Mother of Dragons. Pastel Enchi female. She'll probably get three of these. I feel like an idiot for buying the wrong ones. This is a snake that used to only eat live food. She ate live food for a decade before she came to me and now I've got her eating frozen thawed like a champ. Starting with the little guys. Hey baby. Oh, that's a defensive bite. I thought we were past all this. There you go. You know the drill. Next up, we have what I believe to be a killer blast female. She's really pretty, and her name is Mona. There you go. That's a big prey item for her. Should last a bit. And then we have this guy who is off to his new home tomorrow, but it's feeding day, so I might as well give him a munch. You want it? Oh, no. Yeah, you do want it. You're shy, but you're hungry. I know, I know the feeling. Come on. There you go. All right. Next up, we've got Carpuccina eating a chick. Oh, <laughs> she got me. Anyway, good stuff. Whoa. All right, I did feed off some secondary prey items to the snakes that needed it, but I didn't film it because it was just more of the same. That's it for this video. As you can see, there's a ton of new stuff going on over here. Obviously, I've got a lot of time on my hands to be working on these hobbies, and that is definitely the case. I gotta say, I am very thankful to have found enjoyment in these kind of things because quarantine and this whole year would have been a lot more difficult or even impossible without it. So I hope you guys watching can say the same. I hope you're having fun. I hope you're staying safe. I hope you had a great holiday season and all of the best in the new year the channel is growing we're just about to hit 300 thank you so much to everybody who's watching everyone who's subscribed everybody who clicks that like button or leaves me a comment so i know you're enjoying what i'm putting out so i'm alex aka horrible noise aka hoi noi and this is hoi noi tv thanks for watching be sure to tune in next time where i will be duct taping my head to train tracks and reading some of my favorite passages from Catcher in the Rye.